Uh, well, you know, one day moves in markets are hard to explain. Um, so uh, so I, I don't blame Jim for describing it that way. But to me, the reason I, I thought the market rallied yesterday is that the rationale the Fed gave for why they sort of changed their view on, a, on tapering, plus the roadmap for, for potential rate hikes, uh, is an economy that's normalizing uh, with both, you know, demand shocks fading and the supply shocks fading. But at the same time, that framework concluded the risk that variants like the Delta variant slow the economy. And if Omicron has an impact, that they could walk back uh, this framework. And, and that's very, you know, that's a template that the market understands and agrees with and doesn't think there's policy error. So to me, uh, I think it's actually a risk on roadmap that he provided because it's sort of saying, look, unless Delta and Omicron and Omicron and other variants, you know, don't sort of change the trajectory, the Fed could be tightening. But that's sort of what the market wants, is that a Fed that sort of still has the market's back. Now, you're not trying to describe a Goldilocks environment, are you, where even though we're having Fed tightening, it's what the market wants, it's what the economy can withstand, and yet it's going to be flexible enough in that environment. And by the way, we still have a lot of liquidity, even though they're doubling the pace of the taper. Let's not think that because they're doing that, all of a sudden the rain stops falling from the sky, right? They're, they're still Correct. doing that. That's exactly right. He, he said it several times that tapering is not tightening. It's just not adding accommodation, which is different than removing accommodation, which is what rate hikes are. And I do think the market wants the Fed to be a bit of an inflation watcher and that's very clearly stated so if inflation is not going to track worse than expected then the fed doesn't have to act faster and then if we have sort of you know as you know this looming uncertainty because of these variants and and the transmissibility that's going to you know that's going to create the uncertainty that keeps the fed a little more dovish and i think post confirmation which is in february you know we could also have a change in the character of the fed but at the moment it's important for for powell to be Reconfirm. So you're sticking with your call. I mean, that's the bottom line. 4,800 end of this year, if not even stronger, and 5,000 into the beginning of next year. Yes. Uh, I, I mean, I know uh, the time window is really shrunk because we're essentially only two weeks left of the year, but we know it's a strong seasonal. Uh, we're watching South Africa closely, but as you know, last week positivity started to roll over, and mm -hmm. we're going to check the, the regional cases, but as you know, hospitalizations barely picked up. And then if you look at some of the sewage data in some cities, uh, there's some evidence that potentially were, you know, Omicron's run burn through a lot of areas. So Omicron's very contagious, but then it burns through and people forget there's another side of Omicron, which is when it peaks. Yeah. What do I want to do? I mentioned Endeavor, for example, earlier, and, you know, Kathy Wood is, is buying that now. And, and maybe that's the reason that the stock has a big jump today. But it brings to mind those types of stocks right, the Kathy Wood type names, the ARC stocks, which have gotten obliterated. So what do I do with those now? When people ask you, is it safe to buy innovation fund names, some of the higher multiple, higher valuation, higher price to sales stocks, you, everybody knows the kinds of which we're talking about. Is it safe to buy those today, Tom, or not? Um, you know, there, I think from a, on your, if your time frame is three, five years, I agree with Kathy Wood's view that there's exponential growth coming. And that's because the number of people aged 30 to 50 is actually accelerating in America. Uh, we have some research that number one shows that if you overlay the number of people aged 30 to 50, you know, the five-year change, it's highly correlated with patent growth. So I, I think we're gonna enter a period where there's a lot of innovation coming. It's a lot of these companies she's described, but in a world where people are focused on, you know, antivirals and Fed tightening, these aren't really names people put in their shelf and wheelhouse that they want to own. I mean, to me right now, you'd want to be owning inflation sensitive stocks. But that being said, I, I, I think exponential growers still make sense in your portfolio. Well, it's just tell a timing me, issue. I'm sorry for, I'm sorry for interrupting you. I, th I thought you were finished uh, with, with your sentence. I, I, yeah. I apologize. Um, inflation sensitive stocks. So what, what is that? Give me, give me the areas where I'm going to make the most money in your mind in this new road ahead that we have with the Fed policy change? 
Yes. Uh, I mean, I don't want to own things that have fake price increases because of uh, supply shortages, you know? So I, I don't think core goods prices are really a way to make money as an equity investor. But where there's structural shortage, for instance, in oil, uh, you know, you got a growing economy. And as people, as the global economy emerges from these COVID and it becomes, you know, endemic, demand's going to recover. And as John was saying, business travel will recover, which hasn't yet. That's a price support for oil, especially with little production. And then the energy stocks are trading at a huge gap to that. And, you know, you can see the resilience because as soon as the Fed Band-Aid was ripped off, we've had a big move in these names. So I like energy stocks. Uh, I think next year, the first half is, you know, a period where the market's still trying to digest this. But, you know, financials are actually a pretty good inflation hedge as well. And then some industrials. So it's it's really, again, it's kind of epicenter. But that, that being said, I still like Fang as well. well I mean, I think really. Fang, you know, these got cheap. I mean, it's not really epicenter. And I was going to ask you next about that. So I'm glad you brought it up. Um, are you comfortable? I mean, look, when, when I think of Epicenter and, and others do as I think as well, rather than mm -hmm. trying to speak for a broad array of people, uh, travel stocks, you know, things that are more sensitive to what's going on in, in the world right now with the virus and, and otherwise, or, or those types of names. Are you comfortable recommending those types of stocks right now, travel uh, and leisure, anything in that vein? Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, to me, the travel stocks is like the home builders post GFC because uh, people said you'd never want to own a home builder again uh, because it's a bad business and, you know, no one's going to buy houses. And, you know, you look at the last 12 years, they've been absolute monsters. I think travel and leisure companies are facing a crisis. They've cut costs. Uh, there is a demand problem because uh, and a worker shortage, but the demand problem is, you know, like you said, people are still really nervous about the virus, but that's not true five years from now. Uh, Cause, and if that's not true, the operating leverage and the cost cutting is true. So that means you've got an earnings surprise story with a multiple re-rate and cost of capital low. And, and, and that's, uh, that's a roadmap for making equity returns that are, you know, beating the market. So I, yes, I still like them, but you're right. It's, it's tough to own them between now and your end. Does it get more complicated for investors next year? Let's assume that you're correct. And frankly, you deserve the benefit of the doubt because in large part you have been. If we hit 5,000, for example, in the early part of 22, then what? Does it get more difficult because we then have to think of actual rate hikes in our face along with, you know, who knows what geopolitical issues, not to mention midterm elections and things like that? Yes, uh, Scott, that, that's all a formula for treachery, right? Uh, so if, the, if this year there was turbulence because of the sort of vaccine rollout and the variant emerging, you know, next year the variants are going to emerge, but we probably have a lot more therapeutics, which offsets that. But you're right, the midterms is a new dynamic. Uh, the Fed is that much closer to liftoff. And, you know, liftoff, it, I, I agree with Josh, it doesn't have to happen. Uh, but right now that's, that's the base case for the Fed. Liftoff is not is going to meet is tough and midterm election years, as you know, it's always all the gains are in the second half. You you rarely make money in the first half of a midterm election year. So, yes, I think it's probably a tale of two markets next year. All right. We'll see. I uh, look forward to having many conversations in the weeks ahead with you. Tom Lee, thanks so much. Thanks, Scott. All right. That's Tom Lee. Up next.